Let's have a word of prayer. Father, thank you for uh, this evening. Thank you for these dearly beloved brethren who faithfully come to hear your word. And truly, our hope is in thee and in your word, Lord, quicken us with, with by thy spirit through your word in the midst of all the uncertainties of our day and this life. Uh, we thank you that our hope is not a something that is simply a positive thinking thing, but it is a sure hope that is guaranteed by thee. <clears throat> and it's promised and etched in the inspired text of scripture. And Lord, help us, let, let this hope keep burning a flame in each of our hearts. For as John said, <clears throat> every man that hath this hope in him purifies himself, even as thou art pure. Now we commit to the, our study this evening. Asking once again for your Holy Spirit to illumine our hearts and minds, and like David of old, to open our eyes that we may behold wondrous things out of thy law. We shall thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> All right. So we uh, we went to a series of lessons on uh, on uh, salvation, and somehow talked about the authenticity, or how to do somehow detect what is authentic and what is not. Uh, can I have uh, the host? Yeah, I think I cannot open my screen share. Only the host can share in this meeting, so I'm not fine. Okay, there it is. <clears throat> and uh, I trust that that has somehow given us a clearer and deeper assurance of our salvation that Surely, uh, being assured of our salvation is a biblical thing, and that we have the pillars of God's promise, his prayers, his intercessory work, his purposes, and all that we discussed last time uh, to, uh, as our basis for uh, the assurance. And at the same time, hopefully, I hope the making the distinction between justification, sanctification, glorification has clarified a lot of maybe cobwebs or questions at the back of our mind. Some people think, some Christians think that salvation is when they receive Christ as Savior and that's it. Now that you receive Christ, you just keep on doing this and doing that and singing the choir, pass on gospel tracks as if uh, that's all they need to do. It's all do, 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 do without uh, the being. So, and we saw that salvation is holistic. It's not only salvation from the penalty, of sin, but also salvation from the power of sin through the process of sanctification. So we are continually being saved and we will be guaranteed saved from the presence of sin on the day of glorification. Now we enter, we enter into another topic, another series and has to do with ethics. Now, I think many of you were there when we touched this during the family cap, which I think is, again, uh, brings back fond memories, but that has been quite a while ago. And I think it'll do us well to get through some of these materials once again, <clears throat> especially uh, how long ago was that? Was that four or five years ago? I don't know. So, uh, <clears throat> and uh, as I continue on our earthly sojourn as a believer uh, in this earth, you know, and in this ministry, I have, I'm even more deeply convinced more than ever that biblical ethics is something that has to be founded on and taught amongst God's people. It appears that even among churches, <clears throat> professing Christian churches, a biblical ethics is no longer uh, a concern. Uh, for as long as there's a gathering, there is a group, there is an assembly of believers, uh, never mind. Uh, the doctrinal standards, never mind the ethical, moral standards of determining what is right from wrong, that seems to be, you know, set aside on the wayside and that it has not been given much emphasis. But it is very clear from scripture that doctrine and ethics go together. Our doctrines should be the basis for ethics. And the ethics, our ethical lifestyle, morals should be anchored, rooted in our doctrine, biblical doctrine. And what God has joined together, let no man put us under. So sometimes we get so hooked up with the doctrine, we don't see the practical side to it. And sometimes we all talk about practice, and we don't even know if there is any basis to it. <clears throat> so 
That is why there is, there, there is a need to establish uh, moral standards, to hold a biblical ethics. So I hope this will be clarified even for this night's session. So we're talking about ethics. What are we talking about here? So here's the dictionary's definition. It is the study of morality's effect <clears throat> on conduct. So it is a study of moral standards and how they affect conduct, okay? The subject of ethics is about the good, referring to the values and virtues which, should which we should cultivate, and the right, the good and the right. What are our moral duties? Uh, what, should they, what should they be? And because it is about morality, <clears throat> it is usually related to religion. And of course, the ethics is a normative discipline. It tells us how things ought to be, normative, okay? It's not how this is how the other church does it, this is how the other group does it, this is how they do it in the Philippines, this is how they do it in America, Singapore. No, how should things be done? So uh, <clears throat> ethics is not interested with much with what people do, as it is more interested in what people ought to do. It focuses not so much on what values people presently have, and that's often what the focus is in discussions, uh, rather than in what values people ought to have. Notice that ought there. And the Judeo-Christian tradition is one of the main historical sources of the moral heritage of the Western world. Of course, we are here in the Eastern world. <clears throat> Singapore is heavily influenced by uh, British <clears throat> uh, culture because you were under their colony before in the Philippines under Spain. We were very Roman Catholic. <clears throat> but uh, the Western world is, is heavily influenced by the Judeo-Christian tradition. And uh, it's one of the main historical sources of their basis for morality. So uh, <clears throat> here is where people oftentimes base their ethics or their morality. And perhaps we may find ourselves identifying with one of these bases. Number one, ethics mean right from wrong, basing, basing on what we feel. Something is right if it feels good. Okay? So this worldview is encapsulated in a pop song which, with its lyrics. It can't be wrong if it feels so right. Okay? <clears throat> so apparently that's wrong. Okay? Making feeling right about something doesn't make it right. Okay, um, the affection ethic is another common basis of morality, and this is usually the argument of LGBTQI advocates something is right if we love each other. So, what's wrong if we love each other? Okay, we have affections, one that we're concerned and love each other, so th this cannot be wrong. So, that's the affection ethic. Third is the consensus ethic. <clears throat> In other words, by the very term, others say something is right if we agree, if there's a consensus. So it does not take a scholar to realize that unanimity, even 100% unanimity to a particular decision or course of action may even sometimes spell a recipe for disaster. <clears throat> sometimes uh, there was a time I picked up uh, on the news, for instance, in India, there, were, there was a you know, an incident in a bus, in a public bus vehicle that of uh, a group of young men decided they had a consensus to gang rape a young lady. Well, certainly that cannot be wrong, even though they had a consensus. <clears throat> and of course, the fourth is the biblical ethic, which is something is right because simply God says so. He is the standard of morality. He's our objective basis because everything he says is consistent with his impeccable character. So that's my source in, uh, in this, okay, it's Jim Burke. <clears throat> so <clears throat> now let me make it clear that this is not to say that feeling good, showing affection, seeking a consensus for a particular course of action is always wrong. <clears throat> that is not what we're saying here. We're simply pointing out here that these Pleasure ethics or ple pleasure, affection, and consensus, these are not the basis for determining what is right and wrong. When we do something right, sometimes we feel good about it. Okay. Uh, and so we do something right, sometimes there is feeling 
that results in it, okay? If we do decide to do something right, sometimes there is a consensus. So there's nothing wrong in having pleasure, affection, and consent. But this is not the basis for determining right and wrong. <clears throat> the Bible is, okay? So <clears throat> the Judeo-Christian ethic, otherwise known, biblical ethic or the Judeo-Christian ethic. I thought it would be interesting to <clears throat> uh, quote a, a brilliant scholar of a bygone generation. See, Orthodox, historic, biblical, or fundamental Christianity has always recognized the Bible as the authoritative basis for belief and behavior. <clears throat> the Old and New Testament scriptures were written by some 40 human authors of diverse backgrounds covering a period of 1,600 years in three different coming from three different continents, Africa, Asia, and Europe. And the doctrines and the ethical norms maintained in these documents have been proclaimed, articulated through the centuries in various settings, churches, pulpits, publications, and other gatherings. <clears throat> now, the biblical writers themselves, okay, though they were fallible men, but the writers themselves claimed that their writings were of divine origin. They were breathed out by the, the Spirit of God, the Holy Spirit of God, who drove them to produce an inerrant, inerrant and authoritative text. So we call this the miracle of inspiration. The text is inspired. The writers were driven, moved along by the Holy Spirit. <clears throat> Second Peter 1 and 2 Timothy 3. So while these human authors wrote to their original audiences of their day to address current issues of their day, their writings were apparently preserved for succeeding generations like ours. Jesus Christ himself, now that's the Old Testament. As far as the New Testament is concerned, <clears throat> Christ recognized the Old Testament as a message from God. He acknowledged its historical authenticity, believed its prophetic accuracy, submitted to its divine authority. But he also, although not one line of the New Testament was written during Christ's earthly ministry, he also pre-authenticated the New Testament as he predicted the Holy Spirit's role in guiding its writers into all truth, quoting from John 16, 7 through 15. The Holy Spirit comes, he will guide you into all truth. And I mentioned the word the, is in the Greek text, so all the truth. So in other words, whatever they will be writing was truth. And it's going to be all the truth. It's going to be a complete revelation, okay? nothing to add to it. So these are facts, stubborn facts. And facts are stubborn. They are well substantiated, regardless of how people deny it, dismiss it. The truth of the matter is these are facts. And it is just for ours to proclaim the truth. And that is why the Bible has made an impact on the West. This is the, author, this is the scholar that I was, I mentioned that I would be quoting. Here's what he said. His name is uh, <clears throat> um, Phelps. Okay. Okay. William Lyon Phelps from his book, Human Nature in the Bible, written in 1922, can you imagine that, 1922? Many of us are not around yet. I don't know if anybody here was already around then, but nonetheless, here's what he said. Very interestingly, here's what he said. Quote, everyone who has a thorough knowledge of the Bible may truly be called educated and no other learning or culture, no matter how extensive or elegant, can among Europeans and Americans form a proper substitute. Western civilization is founded upon the Bible, our ideas, our wisdom, our philosophy, our literature, our art, our ideals come from the Bible than from all other books put together. It is a revelation of divinity and of humanity. It contains the loftiest religious aspirations, along with a candid representation of all that is earthly, sensual, and devilish. And here's the interesting quote. I thoroughly believe in a university education for both men and women. But I believe a knowledge of the Bible without a college course is more valuable than a college course without the Bible. Amen to that. I believe that as well. Okay, So I, the knowledge 
uh, by the knowledge of the Bible without a college course is more valuable than a college course without the Bible. And this is written by William Lyon Phelps. He was a brilliant scholar. He's an American author, a critic, a famous a scholar, a famous professor of English literature with degrees from Yale University and Harvard University. Okay, so his life span is from age sixty-five to nineteen forty-three. Okay. So it's important now, we are coming from the Eastern world. We've been heavily influenced by Eastern mysticism, Chinese culture, Filipino culture. There's a lot of Eastern mysticism intertwined even in our religion. Uh, the Western world is heavily influenced by rationalism uh, as a result of the Industrial Revolution and then uh, Sometime after the Reformation, you have the Renaissance, the Reformation, and then uh, rationalism took over, and German rationalism, particularly at the end of the 19th century, which started infiltrating key universities and seminaries at the beginning of the 20th century, where liberalism started entering and uh, making an impact in schools and churches. That is why uh, the booklets called The Fundamentals was written, and anybody who was identifying themselves with what was written in those booklets distributed in 1912 were called fundamentalists. <clears throat> so it was basically a 20th century restatement of New Testament Christianity, because the problem in the Western world is they were regarding human reason equally authoritative, if not more authoritative than divine revelation. In our, in our Eastern culture, then we don't have that objective standard. We go by the whim of mystics or uh, esoteric experiences and such like. Now, who is right? Neither the, the East nor the West, because God is the one who has given us his revelation. That's why there's a need for a biblical Ethics. So when we talk about ethics, remember, we're talking about a set of governing rules based upon a standard. When one makes a choice based upon one standard of right and wrong, <clears throat> between moral and immoral, he's already talking about ethics. So you know, ethics is concerned in answering these questions. What is my motive? When I do something, when I contemplate uh, doing a particular course of action, what is my motive? Because may, maybe what I'm doing might appear uh, philanthropic in the eyes of the world, but my, mo my, my motive is for selfish gain, and that will determine, that will somehow affect whether what I'm doing is ethical. What is my standard? Okay? What is my base for doing my, my course of action? I'm just going by the popular thing, what is uh, politically correct? Is there any principle that I'm uh, abiding on or using as basis for my course of action? And then thirdly, what is my end goal? What, what, am I, what do I want to accomplish in doing this particular course of action? For the Christian, of course, for the Bible-believing Christian, there are clear answers to these questions. So a distinctively biblical Christian ethic number <clears throat> answer to this question is one. What should be the motive of the believer every time he does something? <clears throat> First, 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 31, whether therefore you eat or drink or whatsoever you do, you do all to the glory of God. That should be our motive. That nothing, anything short of that is not right, is not uh, ethical or moral. Okay? See, imagine even the mundane things of eating and drinking should glorify God. What is the standard of the Christian? Of course, it's the word of God. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, reproof, correction, instruction, and righteousness so that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. So it's interesting. God has given us his objective standard, and yet many churches are not even concerned about what the Bible says. They talk about this is how they do it in this church or in this other church, but it, this, they don't know what this is how things ought to be done according to the word of God. <clears throat> the end goal for the Christian and the course of action to take, it should be the advancement of God's kingdom. Even in matters of Christian liberty, <clears throat> that's exactly what was being dealt with in Romans chapter 14, matters of Christian liberty. And where there is room for differences because the word of God is not explicit in addressing a, a particular issue, at the end of the day, now the end goal 
is to advance God's kingdom. That's why Paul said, let not then your good be evil spoken of. For the kingdom of God is not meat and drink, but righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Ghost. And that's your advance God's kingdom. Rather than be divided on issues on, on uh, you know, is it right for a person to eat food offered and sacrifice to idols? Those are the issues that Paul was dealing in Romans 14. And he's saying the kingdom of God is not about meat and drink. It's about righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Ghost. Okay, so that's why we need a biblical ethics. So I'm, I have listed a number of verses here. And uh, just to save time, I'm going to cite only a few of them. Uh, so let me read uh, Leviticus chapter 18. Uh, verses one to five. Here, of course, the apostle, or rather, the uh, Moses was writing. God was speaking to the nation of Israel, and this is part of the law that was prior to their entrance into the promised land. And here's what the Lord said, verse one to five. I'm reading from from my phone here. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, "Speak unto the children of Israel. Remember, they were leaving. They have left Egypt. They're about to enter Canaan, a promised land." And en route, here's what God gave to Moses at Mount Sinai. Speak unto the children of Israel and say unto them, I am the Lord your God. After the doings of the land of Egypt, wherein you dwelt, shall you not do after the doings of the land of Canaan. So don't pattern your lifestyle on what the Canaans do. Whether, whether I bring you, shall you not do? Shall you not do? Neither shall you walk in their ordinances, you shall do my judgments, keep mine ordinances, walk to walk therein. I am the Lord your God. You shall therefore keep my statutes, my judgments, which if a man do, he shall live in them. I am the Lord. Okay, so very clearly, God is making a third distinction between the culture of their day in Canaan and even in, in Egypt. Uh, regardless of what culture, whether that's Egypt or Canaan, it's my standards, my ordinances is what you should do. So Paul, the writer is addressing here, God is addressing the morals and lifestyle of the Egyptians and the Canaanites and that God's people of the Old Testament should be patterning their lifestyle after the word of God. Okay, let's uh, look at another passage, Deuteronomy chapter 12. Again, part of the law. Before they enter into the promised land. They were already now in Kadesh Barnea. And Deuteronomy is what? Deuteronomos is Greek for second. Nomos is law. So that Deuteronomy is the second law. Why second law? Remember during the book of Numbers. Uh, all of the Israelites that came out of Egypt died because of unbelief. Therefore the only ones who got through. Uh, into the promised land were the second generation of Israelites. And that's uh, Moses, uh, Joshua, and Caleb. And even Moses did not get into the promised land. So this is the second law. God had to remind them of what he already told them in the Mount Sinai. He's now reminding them of it again. Deuteronomy chapter 12, reading verse 29 to 32. And the Lord thy God shall cut off the nation from before thee whether thou goest to possess them and thou succeedest them and dwellest in their land take heed to thyself see that thou be not snared by following them after that they be destroyed from before thee and that thou inquire not after their gods saying how did these nations serve their gods even so will I likewise will I do likewise thou shalt not do as uh, as that thou shalt not do so unto the Lord thy God, for every abomination to the Lord which he hateth have they done unto their gods, for even their sons and their daughters they have burnt in the fire to their gods. What things soever I command you, observe to do it. Thou shalt not add thereto, nor diminish from it. I think it would be good for us to read Deuteronomy 18 as well, because this is a key passage, okay? verse 9 to 14. When thou art come into the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee, thou shalt not learn to do after the abominations of those nations. There shall not be found among you anyone that makes his son or his daughter to pass through the fire. Apparently this was a common practice in Canaan. 
or that use of divination, this fortune telling, or an observer of times, or an enchanter, or a witch, or a charmer, or a consulter with familiar spirits, or a wizard, or a necromancer. And why so? Verse 12, for all that do these things are an abomination unto the Lord. And because of these abominations, these are the very reasons the Lord thy God doth drive them out from before thee. In other words, apparently God has been fed up with these Canaanites, with their giving in to occultism and false deities. So God is now commanding the Israelites to drive them out. 13, thou shalt be perfect with the Lord thy God for these nations which thou shalt possess. Hearken unto observer of times and unto diviners. But as for thee, the Lord thy God hath not suffered or allowed thee so to do. Okay, so God, God is addressing the religious practices of the heathen and how God's people should be separate from it. Jeremiah chapter 10, same, same thing. Okay, just to save time again. Uh, it says, learn not the way of the heathen. Okay? So we have an objective standard okay, basis. So what is our standard? It's the word of God. Okay? What is our motive? To glorify God and to advance his kingdom. So God had a clear di directive for his people. And he gave a clear caution or warning because he knew the natural propensity of human nature to depart from him. I mean, that's just natural. All of us have that. Even as believers, as saved people, we still have a sin nature that naturally rebels against God. So it is so easy to go with the tide, to go with the flow, with the culture. And that's why there are numerous warnings in Scripture for God's people, whether in the Old or New Testament, to make sure that we abide by an ethic that is based on God's revelation. Psalms 106, let me read that portion to you, verses 28. At uh, the 35, it says, okay, here it is, Psalms 106, 28 to 35. <clears throat> they joined themselves also unto Baal Peor and ate the sacrifices of the dead. Thus they provoked him to anger with their inventions and the plague break in upon them. Then stood up Phinehas and executed the judgment and so the plague was stayed. And that was counted unto him for righteousness unto all generations forevermore. They angered him also at the waters of strife, so that it went ill with Moses for their sakes. I mean, verse 33, because they provoked his spirit so that he spake unadvisedly with his lips. They did not destroy the nations concerning whom the Lord commanded them, but were mingled among the heathen and learned their works, and so on and so forth. So again, an emphasis on a clear, distinctive line, a demarcation, a separation, which is supposedly a mark of a genuine fundamentalist. You see that again from the Old to the New Testament, the line of holiness or separation is being drawn. We should not learn to mingle or adopt the ways of the heathen. Okay? In the New Testament, we are not left with, with uh, the dark also with clear instructions. I think many of us have committed this passage to Mary. Uh, when it talks about we are to present our bodies to him as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto him, which is our reasonable service. And then be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of our minds so that we may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. So that passage Paul is talking about the change that takes place in every believer and it starts in the mind. As the believer soaks himself in the word of God, all of his prejudices and assumptions that he has learned in his life will be challenged by the spirit of God through the word of God. It is now the responsibility of the Christian to submit to the word of God, allow the word of God and the spirit of God to renew his mind, to substitute his false assumptions with biblical truth <clears throat> so that the transformation begins with the renewing of our mind and then it trickles to our thought processes, our decision-making, our conduct, our lifestyle. So Paul is saying, do not fashion yourself after the standards of your culture or your society. There will always be an anti-biblical ethic in this fallen world, whether that be in the Philippines, in Singapore, or elsewhere. Maybe this is a familiar passage to all of us. Be you not unequally yoked together with unbelievers? 
For what fellowship hath light with darkness? What concord hath Christ to belie? What part hath he that believeth with infidels? So we have there a list of our series of rhetorical questions. And a rhetorical question is a question with an obvious answer. And all of those questions, the answer is there is none. No common ground between God's people and unbelievers. So we cannot have fellowship with them. Now, by the way, that doesn't mean we cannot have friendships with them. If we want to win them to Christ, then we must build friendships. But we cannot have fellowship because we have no common basis or grounds for fellowship with unbelievers. See, we make friends with them because we want to win them to the gospel. And once they get saved, therefore, now we enter into a high a deeper level of fellowship or communion, and that is fellowship because of the common bonds that we have in Christ. So there's nothing common between God's people and those of the world. Ephesians 5, that's a long section. So to make that long section, uh, to summarize that, Paul is saying, set your moral compass. We're living in a world where people don't have a moral compass. They, there's nothing that is kind of uh, setting the rudder so that they, that will determine their course of action. They just go with the tide, they go with what's popular, what is the trend, what is politically correct. And that is sad, especially if we find that taking place amongst God's people or in churches. So there is a people who should know their compass uh, so that unbelievers will somehow groping in the darkness of sin will find out and determine and finally get some light. It should be the born again Christian. First John 2 tells us, love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life is not of the Father. It is of this world. But And this world will pass away and it's lust thereof. But they that do the will of God shall abide forever. So love not the world. He's not talking about the world of sinners. He's not talking about this planet Earth. How can the world be evil? Why should not we not love this planet when God himself created it? The Bible says God loved the world. So why does John tell us to love not the world? Because John 3.6 is talking about the world of sinners. When John talks about loving not the world system, he's talking about a world system, a system of values. Cosmos in the Greek, the world for cosmos uh, means to arrange. The opposite for cosmos is chaos. Okay. Uh, chaos, of course, it stops the turvy. It's it's messy. Cosmos is where we get the English cosmetics. Uh, pardon the ladies, but you know you know why ladies use cosmetics. They wake up in the morning, look at the mirror. It's chaos, so they use cosmos to put to arrange things as they look at the mirror. So the world system is a system that has been arranged by Satan. He is the prince of the power of the air. And he's the one at work in the children of disobedience. He's the one running the world system. Anywhere we go, there is a, an anti-Christian, anti-biblical system that goes against what the Bible says. So we are not to love this world system. So the question, what is there in our culture in which we live that should raise an alarm to us amongst God's people? Whether that be here in Manila or the Philippines or there in Singapore, in Malaysia or in Australia or any part of the world, the United States, doesn't matter. Everywhere we know Satan uh, has the world system organized against God. And as a believer who does not, who although we are in this world, we are not of this world. There is something in our culture that should raise an alarm to us where we as Christians should not accommodate. Okay? We need to be aware of that. So, therefore, we have need, there is a need for a biblical worldview. So, what is a worldview? Uh, another word for worldview is simply a philosophy. Okay? A philosophy is a worldview. It is a set of presuppositions or assumptions. Some of them may be true or partially true or even entirely false. These are presuppositions we all hold, whether consciously, subconsciously, consistently or inconsistently, inconsistently it's something that we hold that basically makes up our world it's the basic makeup of our world how we understand our world so that's a worldview and that is why it's important that our worldview is based on the bible okay? a biblical philosophy remember in colossians chapter 2 i think it's in verse 8 
Paul warned <coughs> that beware, uh, beware, he says, of uh, philosophy and vain deceit after the tradition of men, after the rudiments of this world, and not after Christ. And the word philosophy, remember, is the compound word, phileo and sophia. Sophia is wisdom. Phileo is love. Therefore, philosophy is a love of wisdom. See, what's wrong with loving a love of wisdom? Well, Paul is warning us that there is a, a set of presupposition, a kind of worldview that is patterned after this world. Okay, So it's a wisdom that is patterned after this world. And Paul is saying, beware lest any man spoil you through philosophy and being deceit that is not patterned after Christ. Okay. So we need to be aware of, we need to know a biblical worldview so that we can easily detect a false or a counterfeit worldview. So let me introduce some terms here, but maybe, maybe we've never stumbled before. So <clears throat> we might be using it in the course of our discussion. So ontology is the branch of philosophy or metaphysics that is concerned with the nature and relations of being. So for instance, ontologically, men are and women are different. That's just the way God made them. That's their being. Any attempt to say that they're not, this, they're, I mean, that they're basically the same and that it's possible for a person to be born, a woman born in a male's body and vice versa uh, is obviously a lie, okay? Uh, it's a twisting of one's worldview, okay? Or his metaphysics or philosophy. So there are things that are, that are God designed it the way they are, the relation of being. <clears throat> Epistemology, on the other hand, is the branch of philosophy that investigates, <clears throat> excuse me, on the nature and origin or grounds of knowledge. In other words, where are we basing our philosophy, our principles, our worldview? Is it in the culture? Is it what's popular? Is it the word of God? And so on and so forth. So. That's the study of epistemology. Okay? So we have to know our epistemological base. And for Christians, our epistemological base ought to be our grounds of knowledge is God's word. Axiology basically is another for actions. See? So it's the study of the nature types, criteria of values and of value judgment, especially in ethics. So this is now how it will affect our courses of action. Okay? So we need to be straight in our understanding of the way things are, being ontology, we need to understand where do we base or draw our, our, our knowledge from, it's epistemology, and therefore it should affect our, what is our criteria for value system and value judgments, that's our axiology. And a strategic grasp of this will help us understand the underlying basis of our value system that eventually forms our character and influences our ethic. Okay? So uh, that's why we go all the way down to the very root of what we believe and why we believe them. That's where we will base our worldview and that will offend, influence our ethics. <clears throat> so to the Corinthians, the Corinthians were a bunch of believers. In the first Corinthians, at least Paul was right to the group of believers, but sadly they were being influenced by their culture. Paul called them carnal, babes, immature Christians. And uh, there was hardly a line that was being drawn by their conduct and by their thinking. <clears throat> and while Paul recognized that there are differences in amongst believers and that we are not expected to live uniform lives, but there are still common bases that God has given us. But here to the Corinthians, he leaves us principles for us to live by as Christians even today. What are some of these principles? Number one, okay, before we go to that, two erroneous philosophical doctrinal errors Paul lays down in the New Testament, legalism and antinomianism, okay? So sometimes Christians can fall in either one of these two heresies. They're the left ditch and the right ditch, and both are wrong. The truth is in the radical center. Because the Christian is no longer under the law of Moses, some people say, I'm no longer under the law. I can live as I please. What is that? That's libertinism. That's antinomianism. Antinomianism is anti instead of or against nomos, law, against the law. So some Christians argue that way. 
they use their liberty as a license to sin. And Paul has strong warnings of that in the book of Galatians and other parallel passages. So because the Christian is no longer under the law, this does not mean we can live as we please. Now, uh, on the other hand, there are some professing Christians who want to please God and they live under a burden of rules and regulations. That's legalism. And they do this in order to please God or in order to get saved. Okay. So Paul in 1 Corinthians lays down some clear inspired principles in which the Christian should live. First of all is the principle of expediency. So this basically asks the question, is it proper? Not all things are expedient for me, but not all things are beneficial or profitable. Okay. So while there are certain things in the Christian life where God's word does not explicitly forbid, we still have to abide by certain principles. Not because God has, clearly, has not clearly spoken on the subject means I can live as I please. I still have to ask the question, is it profitable? Will it be beneficial? Okay. So number two is the principle of enslavement. Still in the same verse. Okay, uh, Is it addictive? Paul said uh, all things are profitable or experienced, but I will not be brought under the power of any. I'm not going to allow anything to enslave me. So that's the principle of enslavement. Is, the, is, is, is what I'm doing addictive? You know. So this is where, for instance, issues like... Uh, Social media, Facebook, etc. There's nothing wrong with that. We all use today gadgets and the internet and such like. But when these become addictive, they become they enslave us. Then the word of God should be the spirit of God should be speaking to our consciences and our consciences and sounding the alarm. If it's getting to be addictive, then it's not pleasing to God. The principle of endangerment. In 1 Corinthians 8, Paul is talking about matters of Christian liberty, food offered and sacrificed to idols. And Paul is saying there's really nothing wrong in eating food sacrificed to idols because all food comes from God anyway. And for the Christian, we know that there is only one God. So if I eat food offered sacrificed to idols, it's, it still came from God. But, well, there is nothing wrong in that per se. But if my eating offends my brother, then I sin. Paul makes it very clear. It's sin. If I become a stumbling block to my brother, I wound my brother's conscience. And therefore, for the Christian, a mature Christian will operate on the principle of love rather than the principle of rights. Now, it's my right for me to eat this. Of course, we have that freedom. We have that liberty. But if my freedom is causing somebody to stumble, then my freedom should somehow be restricted and another principle takes over and that's the principle of love. I don't want my brother to, to fumble and stumble. And if it's causing a brother to stumble, then I, am, I should be willing to give up my right in order to help a, a weaker brother. <clears throat> See, So that's why Paul said at the end of the chapter, if my eating makes my brother to offend and therefore I will eat no flesh while the world standeth, lest I make my brother to offend. Fourth principle is the principle of edification. Okay? And all things be done unto, edif and unto edification. In other words, is my course of action edifying? In other words, remember the word edifying is where we get the word edifice. Does it build or does it simply destroy or waste time? So if it's edifying, then pursue it. No, that's, it's probably worth pursuing. <clears throat> then the principle of exaltation. We already saw that in 1 Corinthians 10.31. Is it glorifying to God? So these are some principles we can draw from Scripture so that we know we will help us to determine what is right from wrong, even in matters where Scripture is not explicit. Paul's reason for giving up his rights and restraining his liberty, he said, is for the gospel's sake. So here's that's a mature Christian. A mature Christian, remember, the mature Christian manifests the fruit of the Spirit. He does not allow the flesh to dominate him. See, so when you talk, when, when, when a society or even a church that keeps talking about rights and rights and rights, that's a sure recipe for disaster. For a Christian, he's the, we don't talk about rights in scripture. Talk, it gives emphasis on responsibility. 
And as a responsible Christian, if a Christian is mature, he will be concerned to the plight of others. So he, was, he should be willing to restrain his liberty and give up his rights for the gospel's sake. Paul knew that propagating the gospel was more important and was definitely approved unto God. So let's look at the, uh, this paradigm of truth. I always like to refer to this chart because uh, it gives me a panoramic view all throughout history on where people get their epistemological base, okay? And perhaps each one of us can relate to this and maybe can identify where do I base my belief system? Okay. What is my epistemological base? So beginning in the first century, the early church, after the death of Christ, resurrection, ascension, and then the inauguration of the church in the day of Pentecost sometime AD 30, at least the paradigm of truth was laid down. It was not well, it was not universally accepted, but at least there was a consciousness that there is a basis for right and wrong, for ethics, for truth, and that's the scriptures. So we may call this a biblical worldview. <clears throat> and the key prominent churches that were used to the Lord to articulate biblical truth are the churches in Ephesus, in Alexandria, and in Rome. So we place up until about 500 AD when the fall of the Roman Empire, about 470 AD. <clears throat> and of course, by about 325 AD, the Roman Catholic Church was already into the fore. <clears throat> it was already forming. And somehow there has been a shift of epistemology, basis for truth. So let's call this the pre-modernism era, covering a 1,000 year period. That's what we call the Dark Ages. Since the fall of the Roman Empire, all to be just prior to the Reformation. <clears throat> so these are the Dark Ages. You know why they're called the Dark Ages? Because the Bible was kept from the hands of the layman. The Word of God, imagine, was kept only supposedly exclusively to the clergy. And they were the only ones who had the authority to interpret God's Word. Okay? The layman cannot do so. So this is pre-modernism era. And truth was equivalent to faith, more important than logic. So they have departed from a biblical worldview, but they still call it a Christian worldview okay? because it was predominantly Christian in the sense that it was Roman Catholic. Okay? So they developed from faith in the scriptures. There was a shift to faith in the church. And of course, this led to into corruption and carnality and faith eventually was represented sadly by the Roman Catholic Church. That's why it's called the Dark Ages. They did not know what God's word said. It's amazing how we're living in a day that is now very accessible to the our fingers through our gadgets. It's still the best seller of all time, but it's unfortunately the least read. Okay, then modernism from the 1500 till about World War II. Okay. <clears throat> Rationalism took over after, uh, you know, after the Renaissance, the Reformation, and then the Enlightenment age and rationalism took over and therefore modernism or rationalism basically sometimes reason became more authoritative than, uh, or logic became more authoritative than faith or the Bible. So they subjected the Bible to uh, criticism of the intellectuals. Rather than subjecting themselves or mind to the word of God, they let the Bible subject to the criticism of fallible, although intellectuals. And therefore, truth became redefined as logic over faith. We can call this the humanistic worldview. And this is the happened from the time of the Renaissance all the way sometime to the Reformation, right after to the dark ages and this paradigm focused from god to man okay? a horizontal but not a vertical outlook starting with logic rather than faith okay? and this escalated of course with the race rise of german rationalism until world war one came over and then more so in world war ii headed by luther I'm sorry, by uh, German soldier, uh, Hitler. Okay, so the so World War II, this is kind of World War II in Germany was thought to be the epitome of intellectualism. 
but they saw that, listen, I thought we were so brilliant, intelligent. I mean, books have been written about uh, evolution at this time and so on and so forth. And yet, what happened? We we're so intelligent and yet we had two world wars. So apparently the, the uh, corruption of, uh, and the spiritual bankruptcy of rationalism was exposed. Rightly so, because only the gospel can give answers to man's questions. So that's up until 1945. Postmodernism, okay, that's after 1945. See, instead of reason becoming the basis for right and wrong, at least reason, wrong as it is to be the basis for belief and behavior, it had parameters. Whatever was not reasonable was not accepted as true. So therefore, there, there cannot be miracles. How can Mary ever conceive and bear a son having not known a man. That is unreasonable and therefore it cannot be accepted as true because it's a miracle and it goes beyond reason. You see, Christianity is never unreasonable. Christianity never goes against reason. It may go beyond reason, but it will never go against it. That's the beauty of the Christian faith. So here's postmodernism. Uh, after World War II, they say World War I and World II and yet, this is, we are still in a mess, even worse. So postmodernism, truth became equivalent to zero. In other words, there's nothing to unify us anymore in the way we think. No absolute truth. Why? Because it's a pluralistic worldview. Everybody has his own worldview. No absolute truth. Today, they talk about truths, plural. No one single absolute truth. Anybody who says there is no absolute truth has just contradicted himself because he just stated what he believed to be an absolute truth. So the enemy now is one who says there is absolute truth. And 9-11 made people think of the validity of pluralism. Some think the attack of terrorists may indicate the end of pluralism because, of course, Muslims do believe in absolute truth. Okay? They have their... Quran and so on and so forth, and they're, they're, they're God. So what happens after 9-11? What do you think will take place? Well, nowadays, uh, we're living in a pluralistic world, a society. Truth is now equivalent to zero, but even worse, uh, nobody knows what truth is. So they're looking for somebody who will unite people. Therefore, truth will be equivalent to a leader. Whoever will unite people. Okay, we're so messed up and so divided that somebody, we need somebody to unite people. And that's a leader that we need. So we're headed in that direction. Even in our politics here, politicians talk about, okay, you vote me and I will unite, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, so this becomes a pragmatic and a syncretistic worldview. Never mind right and wrong. Whatever works for me is right. Okay? <clears throat> Never mind if it's biblical or not. Syncretistic worldview, they will get all these different worldviews and then synchronize them so that it will whatever will work for each one. So as early as 1957, Henry Spock of the Council of Europe, United Nations, said this, quote, not want another committee. We have too many already. What we want is a man of sufficient stature to hold the allegiance of the people and lift us out of the economic morass in which we are sinking. Send us a man and be he God or the devil, we will receive him. Scary, isn't it? As early as 1957, we're headed in the kind of world like that. Be he God or the devil, we will receive him. And of course, we know if we're familiar with the old with the scriptures, there's a man of sin who's going to come into the scene and will try to unite this world. So this is the paradigm of truth. And of course, we still have those previous worldviews uh, existing today. But these are the dominant worldviews that we see in our current uh, scenario. Of course, the Christian should always base his worldview with the word of God. So where do you base your worldview, your truth? Okay. So uh, the heart is deceitful, but there are, here are some statements about man's thinking. That's why we need the Bible. 
as our objective standard. See, Christianity is an objective <clears throat> religion. It's not subjective. And because God's word talks about our thinking, the heart is deceitful above all things and is desperately wicked. Who can know it? I, the Lord. So it's so desperate. The depths of human depravity is so deep. Nobody can know it except who? Except the Lord. That's why he says, I, the Lord, search the heart. I try the reins, even to give every man according to his ways and according to the fruit of his doings. Okay. Again, Proverbs 3, Solomon, as he was moved by the Spirit of God, trust the Lord with all thine heart and lean not unto thine own understanding. See, you cannot trust your own thinking. We have the word, we need the word of God. In all thy ways acknowledge him and he shall direct thy paths. Be not wise in thine own eyes. Fear the Lord and depart from evil. Isaiah says, for my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, saith the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts higher than your thoughts. You cannot go wrong by following the word of God. Okay, so uh, I think with a few more slides here, God's a Mr. Molly, where should God, where does God want or to base us to base our belief system? God's ontology and epistemology is revealed explicitly. As a matter of fact, you go study deeper the book of Colossians. <clears throat> Paul lays that out down there. His axiology is also taught in scripture, the practical section of the book of Colossians and other parallel passages. Therefore, it is the Judeo-Christian ethic that should be our, our epistemology. Paul was driving at the idea in Colossians that the fullness of the whole universe is where? It's found in Christ, no, nothing else. The biggest concept of the universe is not in a philosophy that man can ever think of. It is not in a philosophy, nor in a thing, or in a force. It is in a person, Jesus Christ, because he is the truth. All reality is not built in Christ. All reality is Christ. And therefore, because of who he is, and whatever he is in contact with, is automatically and naturally complete. He is the truth. So without Christ, you will never see things objectively and truthfully. Because Jesus Christ, according to the book of Colossians, is the complete of creation, the church, the process of reconciliation, of ministry, of all wisdom and knowledge. And you are dwell with all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. And we are complete in Christ. Okay. So without Christ... There's no way we can see things properly. So here comes some conclusions on these lectures on epistemology. <clears throat> Since truth is in a person, our understanding of truth is completely dependent on our relationship with him. <clears throat> no one can hope to understand God's reality unless he knows the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus said, this is life eternal, that they might know thee the only true God in Jesus Christ and thou hast sent. In him, in Christ, dwells all truth. <clears throat> So as Christians, we need to realize that our fullness and our fulfillment cannot be found elsewhere but in Christ and his will for our lives. Anything we do outside the orb of his will and outside Christ will always end up a stalemate. It will always end up detrimental to us. Life outside Christ is living in a dream world that is not for real. It's like going to Disneyland, right? In other words, when you go to Disneyland, it's a dream world. It's an amusement park. You know why they call it an amusement park? The Greek word museo means to think. With the prefix a, a museo means not to think. People go to Disneyland, the amusement park, so that they will not think. They, they kind of, it's a form of escape from reality. And a lot of people are living in the amusement park, even Christians. And thus Christ, it's not for real. They're, not, they're living a lie. Thus, Christ should not be simply our priority. Uh, as Paul says in Colossians, he should be preeminent in all of our lives. As Christians, it should be our goal, not simply to convince unbelievers of the logical soundness of our faith, but to connect them to the person of Christ. We need to get them saved. Any questions, therefore? <clears throat> <clears throat> any questions all right there's something here when the lord your god cuts off before you the nations when you go into oh, this is a quotation 
<clears throat> take care and you will not be ensnared. And da, da, da. You shall not worship the Lord. That everything that I can. Okay, so that's basically, like, I think, a quotation, if not, I'm not mistaken, from from the Deuteronomy, if I'm not mistaken. All right, any other, any questions? This is one of the subjects I enjoy teaching, you know, because it's so, it never loses its relevance. And all of us always have the natural propensity and tendency to drift and accommodate to the culture. That's why this checks us always, this checks me going back. I, oh, well, my standard is the word of God. Questions? Mm -hmm. This, this is a very broad overview. And then the principles were being taught. So that's why we can able to understand the broad view uh, of biblical. Yeah. yeah I, think. <clears throat> I mean, uh, even in the States right now, do you know that in the States, fundamentalism, the word fundamentalism has virtually lost its meaning because people have misrepresented because of the misrepresentations of fundamentalism and unless we understand what fundamentalism is from a biblical and historical worldview we will also be carried away uh, biblical christianity is nothing but as we said earlier the 20th century restatement of new testament christianity it's bible believing bible obeying christianity in the words of david bill it is the unqualified acceptance of and obedience to the scriptures. What do you think of Christian lobbying against a secular policy that deviates from biblical principle? For example, abortions. Is it hard? It is hard to argue with the secular world because they do not know Christ. That's correct. I mean, we don't argue with the secular world. We win them to Christ. Christians are not here in this world to save the world. Christians are here in this world to save sinners out of this present evil world galatians 1 verse 4 this world is going to be ripe for judgment god is not going to save this world he's going to give us a new heaven and a new earth it's not a renovated heaven and earth he's going to give us a, because this world is headed for judgment and the church is here on this earth to preach the gospel to get sinners right with god so that they will be saved out from this present evil world okay now, if you're talking about lobbying, let's say in Congress, is that what you're referring to? If I understand that correctly, uh, um, uh, you, here's what uh, here's what I've done. What we've done here is I've written articles on biblical ethics, like capital punishment, homosexuality, biblical perspective, mm. and then I tried to address uh, the issue, knowing I have two sets of audience: Christians and non-Christians. So that at the end, I give the challenge. Okay, if you have not received Christ as Savior, then you need to be saved. And then if you are a Christian, therefore, you need to align yourself with the, with the biblical teachings that are articulated in this pamphlet or in this book. So, and then we give that out. We gave that out in Congress, in the Senate. And, and that is our closest of lobbying, you know, because we don't, at least you do. Congress will know that there are people who take a stand on certain issues. And I've had a chance to talk to some of our congressmen and even some of our senators. And they were really, I mean, they like, oh, you have very nice paper. And they thought it was just some, some kind of low quality paper. Of course, we made it very presentable so that they will at least read it. And <clears throat> I, well, I'm not trying to change the world or the Philippines, but I'm trying to simply plant the seed. If they read the pamphlet, well and good for them. I've succeeded in planting the gospel seed to them. If they get converted, even better, you know. But you cannot win, let's say, a communist or a, an abortionist by simply lobbying, by changing the rules or the laws. Okay? Uh, you, you, can, you can change a lobby, uh, an abortionist or a homosexual by, with the gospel by changing his heart. But of course, there needs to be a, you know, somehow a voice that people in government needs to hear. Oh, there are people. And that might somehow, who knows, influence them. As a matter of fact, when we passed out our, our, our pamphlet on capital punishment, that was amazing how God did work there. Um, because our Congress during that time was planning to remove it. 
and uh, we had somebody who had killed, raped and killed his daughter and was sentenced to death and now it was time to execute him and now the Roman Catholic Church was raising their voices that there should be no capital punishment, no death penalty. <clears throat> so we gave that our pamphlet. And then somehow I walked into the Manila Bulletin. It was a daily broadsheet. And to my surprise, lo and behold, you know, I talked to the editor and I don't even know them. And they saw the art. Everybody was talking about the issue in radio, television. And then so they saw my article and said, why don't you sit down? Then they browsed to my article, removed two paragraphs. And they, I removed two paragraphs and they got my photo. That was on a Thursday. And Sunday that weekend, my article was on the newspaper with my picture. I said, wow, the, the newspaper became a gospel track <laughs> at the Manila Bulletin. And people buy the Manila Bulletin, especially on Sunday because of the classified ads. And that was amazing how the Lord worked. And then I met one of the congressmen here in Green Hills. And he said, oh, so you're Pastor Limpioco. He said, yes, I said. So you were the one who wrote this because I gave him. I saw him in the mall. Yeah. So did you know that we actually quoted this? Really? I said, I hope you gave proper accreditation. You didn't <laughs> plagiarize. But nonetheless, he said that they quoted it. And during that time, uh, capital punishment stayed so that the person who was who was scheduled for execution was executed. Now we have we have capital punishment again, uh, you know, suspended. <laughs> see, so that's the kind of culture we have. See, so we're not called to save the world; we're called to save sinners out of this world. So I, I do that just to, to get people know the gospel and know what the Bible says. And in talking to some of these senators, uh, if they. They, they started asking me some questions. You know, some people said, some of them said, you know, I'm against capital punishment, but I will read this. Amen. <laughs> I was happy enough. The other one asked me, you know, is there something in the Bible that talks about what if the judgment is not meted out immediately? That uh, does that somehow promote lawlessness? I said, yes. Did you know Solomon said it in the book of Ecclesiastes? So I got, I was, I got engaged into some of the, the discussion. The other one, uh, I saw him, we were together in the elevator, and, and he was in favor of capital punishment. He said, I'm going to pass this out, see. And amazing, uh, during that time, this was some time ago, uh, so when it was published in the newspaper, two days after the Sunday it was published, I got a phone call from a certain Reverend Jaime Bokirin. Left his message in the answering machine, I returned his call. I said, can I talk to Pastor Bokren? I am just returning his call. I haven't met him, but I, you know, he called. And then, so he finally got to the other end of the line, and he, I said, uh, oh, so Pastor Livioko, I'm so happy I can talk to you. I just want to let you know that I am not a pastor. I'm a Roman Catholic priest. I said, oh, really? <laughs> what did I do? I said, you know, so how can I help you? They said, I read your article in the Manila Bulletin. And as you know, the bishops here in the Philippines are all against the death penalty. But I am the national director of the Dominican Order. United, uh, UST, that's University of Santa, they're, they're the first university in the Philippines. <clears throat> and he said, and do you know that among all the Roman Catholic clergy and bishops, only the Dominicans are in favor of the death penalty. That's why we like your article, he said. As a matter of fact, I said, I, if you don't, I hope you don't mind. I fought to copy your article and gave it to the faculty of University of Santo Tomas. I just wanted to get their, their feedback. And if you have something in pamphlet form, I'm happy to visit you and get copies of it. I said, by all means. So he came, surprisingly, a Roman Catholic priest visiting me. And uh, so I gave him copies and he was asking how much he was going to spend. I said, that's for free. You can give it, up, give it away. That was in a fe February. He came to me. And when he came to me, he brought a box of tikoi. You know what the tikoi is? The sticky bread? Because it's Chinese New Year, you know, uh, February. Usually that's, that's one of the things that they give for Chinese New Year. So he said, here's a gift for you for stickier friendship. I said, uh-oh, stickier friendship. <laughs> so false teacher. But at least he was very cordial. And uh, we were able to give that, the truth to them. So it's amazing how God works. You know? And, and that's how my, that's the closest I can think of, of lobbying. You present your case, give the truth of the word of God. Because I cannot imagine, of course, they didn't have Congress in the Roman Empire. 
but I, I cannot imagine Paul and Barnabas lobbying at the streets, uh, you know, fighting against, uh, you know, same-sex marriage or even slavery. I mean, they went out preaching the gospel. That's what they did. And that's what we should be doing because that's where the problem is, sin. And that's where the solution is, the gospel.